Good morning, Foundations. It's so good to be back. For all my friends in Windsor, those who are watching online, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I just have to say, first off, thank you. Um, last month, I um, kind of filmed my teaching from my office in Arizona, and I had COVID. And um, many of you uh, sent me emails, and, and, and you said things like, you look terrible, which that's that's okay. And then two, uh, your prayers. And it just meant the world. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you. And then the second thing I just want to say, just before we start this message, um, I did something I've never done before. I mean, I've been coming here about 18 months. I've, I've done a lot in walking different restaurants in Fort Collins or Loveland or Windsor. I love downtown Windsor. Um, but I did something I've never done before. I went to Shields. Yeah, it'll change your life. I didn't know there was a Ferris wheel in there. I don't know, like, you could listen to a speech from Abraham Lincoln. I don't know, Thomas Jefferson. I, I didn't know that there was, like, a bowling alley. Like, I didn't know they had every article that Patagonia has ever made. I didn't know that they had this, like, you could find a Wolverine there, which is near and dear to my heart. Like, there is so much there. And then I sat there and I was like, man, if 2020 gets even crazier, and, like, God forbid, it's not going to happen. But just say, like, the craziest thing were to happen, I would go, if I lived in northern Colorado, if it, like, got crazy, I'd go hide out in Shields. I mean, it's got everything. It's got food. I'm standing in line. This nice oh, a woman comes up to me and goes, would you like fudge? And I'm like, I obviously don't need it, but yes, I want it. And so, like, I, I like, I, it was unbelievable. I mean, Shields, I don't know if, you, if the owner, Mr. Shields or Mrs. Shields, goes here, but I'll be your spokesperson. That place is amazing. I'm going there every time I come to Foundations. Um, today we're in a series called Christmas Interrupted, and I think there's good interruptions. You know, it's like when your boss walks into your office and is like, hey, um, you got a raise. That's a good interruption. It's a good interruption when you find out that your wife's pregnant. Good interruption. Uh, there's also bad interruptions. Uh, interruptions that you just sort of like kind of just feel stressed, and then all of a sudden the water heater goes out. That's no good. It's a bad interruption. And, and what Pastor Marcus week one did was he talked about the interruption that came to Mary. And last week, Carl, Pastor Carl talked about the interruption that came to Joseph. And, and today I want to I talk about that. Not about Mary, not about Joseph, but I want to talk about how Christmas interrupted the king. And, and the book of Matthew, it details this. It says this in chapter 2, verse 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, you got to understand, King Herod, uh, he was known as Herod the Great. That's a good title if you can get it. Herod the Great. And I'll tell you what, this guy was a monster. He killed his wife. He killed three of his kids. And this guy, this guy when he died, he had decreed that I want 3,000 leaders to be murdered the same day that I'm dead so that there were, I can ensure that there will be mourning happening in the land. This guy, anybody who came near that was a threat to his power, to his kingdom, he was going to shut it down. So look at this. Some magi come, and they, they show up. And the magi, these, these three wise men, they show up, and they're like, hey, where's the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. They're not so wise if they're going to Herod going, where's the real king? I mean, literally, this is like they are putting their life at stake. And the next verse says it all. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all J-Town with him. Like King Herod, when he gets disturbed, when he gets triggered... All of Jerusalem starts freaking out, going, this, is, this isn't going to be good. This is not going to be good. This is not going to be good. And so King Herod, before he acts, he does something. He calls all of the chief priests, all of the rabbis and teachers of the law, and he asks them some questions. He asks them where the Messiah was to be born. And I guarantee you one of the chief priests is like, well, the book of Micah says Bethlehem. And, and, and I imagine he goes, well, tell me more about this, this prophesied new king. And I, bet, I imagine one of the teachers of the law, one of the rabbis saying, oh, Isaiah, one of the foremost prophets, he said this. He said this about this king. And all of a sudden, Herod, this monster who called himself Herod the Great, this man, 
made this decree that every child in Bethlehem under the age of two would be gone. Genocide enters the world. I'm, I'm telling you, when this guy felt threatened, he did something about it. He did something about it. Herod, um, there's a lot written about him. This is what he looked like, supposedly. Uh, um, great beard, I'm trying to get one like him. Um, but Herod, Herod was actually really insecure. He's just not a good dude. But I will tell you what he was really great at. He was an incredible architect. And if you've ever been to the Holy Land, or if you've ever studied, you will see that his architecture is something that people still talk about. You think of King Solomon's temple? It was six acres. It was pretty big. And King Herod, when he decided to build the temple for the Jewish people, he said, I'm going to make it bigger. And he made it 30 acres. It became a tourist attraction. People from all over the world wanted to see King Herod's temple. And Josephus, the historian, says that when you heard of King Herod's temple, you thought it was incredible. Just when you heard about it, 30 acres inside, leveled with gold. I mean, just 15, 16 stories high. I mean, just massive. But Josephus says, when you actually saw it with your very own eyes, you left utterly amazed giving reverence to God. It was that profound of, a, of like this incredible temple. And this is what uh, scholars think it looked like. And you look at these stones down here, they're, they're actually known as Herodian stones. Herod hired all of the priests to cut the stones because he, he was assured that the priests would cut them to perfection because this was building the house of God. 15, 16 stories tall, inside the Holy of Holies, all gold. Up at the top, six foot grape clusters. This thing was massive. Scholars say, and you can, if you've been to the Holy Land or been to the Temple Mount, these stones go down multiple stories, six, seven stories, and you see they're perfectly cut stones to this day. Herod is a monster in real life, but he was a great architect. Now, there's another place. It's called the Masada. This is what it looked like. It, it was out in the middle of nowhere. This was his desert winter, his desert, his like winter home out in the desert, and basically there was one small pathway up. This fortress, this place, it was like the safest place. Even during like a, a revolt, a lot of the Jews went there and they could hide out because you could only get up to the top one by one. And if you were at the top, it gave you such opportunity to take out your enemy. At the Masada, and you can go to it to this day, there was a pool at the very bottom that literally... They say you could actually drive a small boat in, which makes you wonder, where did they get water? King Herod had people bring water. Buckets up, dump it in. Buckets, dump it in. It's amazing. But if you really want to check something out, uh, if you want to see Herod's summer home, this is what it was. It's called the Herodian. And up at the top was this just beautiful, beautiful palace. Again, bathhouses, I mean, just opulent. And this guy was so wealthy. When the Olympics were basically going bankrupt, King Herod funded the Olympics. This guy had so much money. The problem about this place was that he built this up on a mountain so that he could have during the summer a view of Jerusalem just so that the people know that King Herod was always watching. The problem was there was another mountain blocking its view. And so you know what Herod did? He hired some people to move a mountain. Which is fascinating because if you ever wonder when Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. And we've all taken that to go, I just need faith this big. And what Jesus is really saying, that dude didn't have much faith and he was able to move a mountain. Imagine what you could do with actual faith. And, and Herod was insanely gifted as an architect. And he kept building because he, he wanted to build something so people would look at him and go, man, you're great. You're powerful. You're resourced. You're a leader. You've achieved. I don't even have time to detail the city of Caesarea. I mean, the harbor, people still talk about. The aqueduct, you couldn't get water till 10 miles away. And he built this pathway of water. That You should Google it today. It's unbelievable. When you see it with your own eyes, it blows your mind. And to this day, scholars are like, how was he so forward thinking as an architect? He was a great architect, but... Anybody who got close to his throne or his kingdom, he just was scared. 
And he's leading. He's building. He's building his name. It's great. And all of a sudden, three wise men show up and they're like, hey, hey oh, where's the real king? This is an interruption. This is a profound interruption. Now, I want to kind of talk about Christmas just for a second. Because I imagine all of us watching online at Windsor here in Loveland, I mean, we've probably heard Hallmark. We've probably seen Lifetime movies. We've seen, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks. Every company is trying to tell us what the reason for the season is. And literally, just, just whether you're online, whether you're at Windsor, whether you're here, shout it out. Blank is the reason for the season. What would you say is the reason for the season? It'll come up on the screen in a second. Blank is the reason for the season. What, what is it? Jesus, some of you would say. Yeah, some of you would say Jesus. I think it's fascinating. But I think what's amazing is when you actually look at Isaiah, written somewhere between 750, 800 years before the birth of Jesus, in Isaiah 9, it says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government, the ordering of things, the justice of things, the right and wrong of the cosmos will be on his shoulders. Can you imagine King Herod hearing this from the chief priests and the rabbis? Someone's probably telling him Micah, Bethlehem, and Isaiah this, and I bet he's going, I'm going to shut this thing down. And then it continues on, and it says, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then it continues on in verse 7. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. And anytime you see justice and righteousness together, it's basically justice plus righteousness equals shalom, equals peace on earth. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Friends, I just need you to understand. Can you imagine how insecure King Herod must have been when he heard this? I mean, just, this is wild. But I think Isaiah prophesies and says something about Jesus, but he really says something that I think is so crazy. Two times in verse 6, he says, To us a child is born. To us a son is given. If really, if you want to know what the reason for the season is, you are. You are the reason for the season. I mean, think about this. Jesus was perfectly placed at the right hand of the Father. But why did he come here? For you. For me. If this world was perfect, I think he'd still be up there. But you are the reason for the season. And seriously, this has been super helpful for me because when someone cut me off driving on the 25 today or the other day, I just said, you're the reason for the season. You know, you're at Walmart and people are fighting over PS5s. You go, you're the reason for the season. You're the reason Jesus came. I mean, this is what Christmas is about, is this reality of you are the reason for the season. But then who's Jesus? Jesus is the gift. The gift. What Isaiah says is that this gift is going to have these four profound attributes. And these attributes are wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. But I want you to understand something. I think we've missed it. I think we've only seen this as attributes, things that we could say are facts about Jesus. Whether when Isaiah is writing this and how the, the first hearers understood it wasn't just attributes but that we would actually have access to these attributes profound difference a sense of wonderful counselor that this gift would come into this earth and it would have this level of profound wisdom and this wisdom would actually help us live our one and only life. And Jesus brought this gift and he would tell his disciples, it's good for me to go because the Spirit of God is coming. And the Holy Spirit would come. And you've got to understand this wonderful counselor is a gift from heaven. It's a gift of wisdom to help us live like Jesus. But it's going to guide us in wisdom to live for Jesus. And it's going to guard us with wisdom to stand for Jesus. The truth is, I think many of us go, yeah, i got a wonderful counselor. But how, how often are you accessing the wisdom of Jesus in your one and only life? The second one, mighty God. 
In Hebrew, it's the word El Gabor, which is just so fun to say. Sounds like the cousin of El Chapo. But like El in Hebrew is the word God. So if you think of like Joel, which is like two, two words, Jehovah or Yahweh, and El, Ya'el, it's like God, God, personal God, powerful God, reverent God, personal God, right there. El, Gabor, Gabor is where we get this word mighty or powerful. Now, what's amazing is that the Hebrew people understood God being so personal, but yet so powerful. If you think about, like, the ten plagues, when, when, like, Pharaoh was, like, out of his mind going, who is this God that's doing this? And the magicians and sorcerers couldn't actually solve what God was doing. They said, basically, it's the fingers of God. And so the Hebrew people thought there was so much power in just the fingers of God that they would often say prayers, and when they would say prayers, they would lift up their smallest finger, their pinky, up in the air as a sign that there was so much power with God. And the truth is, you would see throughout the scriptures of people reaching out, trying to access the power, the mightiness, the El Gabor, the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, and she had gone to doctors, she had spent everything she had. She sees this rabbi who's walking with a prayer shawl, as she do, she reaches out, El Gabor, and she's healed. Do you understand that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is within you? And here's the question that you've got to ask yourself. When's the last time you accessed El Gabor? Because I'm watching 2020, and I'm watching the church, and I'm watching people, and I realize that there is a massive rivalry going on between my problems versus his power. My problems versus his promises. My problems versus his perspective. And too often, I'm letting my problems be bigger. And I'm not accessing. I'm not reaching out. I'm not remembering the power of God. The third attribute, and it's, it's more than an attribute, it's something we have access to, is this word everlasting father. This word everlasting in Hebrew is the word ah, and it's like perpetuity, it's, an, it's no end. It's just it's this everlasting father. And, and you got to understand that in, in, the, in the Hebrew culture, especially during the Old Testament times, if a father died, even, even if the mother was still there, that child would be known as an orphan. Because the whole financial system was disrupted. And so all of a sudden you have this sense of an everlasting father. A father who has no end. A father who's, who's going to walk with you. A father who's going to help you. A father who's going to receive you. A father that's going to welcome you. It's not based on your performance, because that's how Herod was. It's based on his love. You read Psalm 106, and it says, like, man, we are bent, bent, bent on rebellion, and yet out of God's great love, he relents, relents, relents. Why? Because he's an everlasting father. And when you understand this truly, you recognize, you recognize that God is the God of first, second, third, fourth, thousandth, hundred thousandth, millionth chances, because why? He has no end, and he just wants to welcome you. But for many of us, we're like Herod, where we're trying to build our identity on something that we've done, something that we've accomplished, where our kids go to school, how good they are in sports. We build our identity on something that we think somebody will look at our life and going, that's great. And I'll tell you the truth, you will live with integrity for where you find your identity. But when you find your identity with an everlasting father, it shapes you. Lastly, Prince of Peace. This is an attribute, but man, this is access. Access to his peace in the moment. I, I, people often ask me, they see, what, what do I get for following Jesus? I'm like, oh, that's easy. They're like, what? I'm like, you get Jesus. You get the fullness of grace and truth. You get everything that Jesus has and Jesus offers, not just tomorrow, not just someday. You get it right here and right now. Friends, you're the reason for the season, and Jesus is a gift. I think about this wonderful counselor, and I compare it to Herod. Herod wasn't a wonderful counselor. He was wicked and cruel. He wasn't a mighty God. He thought he was. He was a mighty tyrant. He was not an everlasting father. I kid you not, his rule and reign was only 33 years, and his whole kingdom has come to a pile of rocks. He wasn't a prince of peace. 
He was a prince of evil, destruction, and death. You got to face this real question of whose plan am I on? Herod's plan or God's plan? I grew up in Southern California. Many of you know this. And my dad would uh, often leave for work super early. And during the summer, I was often home alone. And so I would sneak up into the office, and I had this kind of daily routine where I'd go into my dad's office, I'd open up the closet, and inside this closet was the greatest record collection ever. I mean, I'm talking Led Zeppelin, I'm talking John, Paul, George, Ringo, the Beatles, I'm talking, I'm talking Steve Lynn Morris, a.k.a. Stevie Wonder, Jeff Beck, Todd Rundgren, I mean, Earth, Wind, and Fire, you name it, Creedence, Clearwater, Revival, he had it. And I would go through, and every day I would listen to a different record, and I'd pull out the record, I'd put it on the record player, lift up the tone arm, I'd move it over, that sound. And some of you are like, records? What are you talking about? But if you've ever heard that analog sound, the needle hitting that scratch, the sound, and it would start to play. And then I'd go into my dad's closet. I'd open up this bass guitar case, which he made, and I would sit in his office chair, and I would imagine myself playing with Zeppelin or the Beatles. I'd listen to one side, lift up the tone arm, flip it over, listen to the second side, and then after doing that, I'd place the album back into its sleeve and then back into the milk carton. I did that on a regular basis listening to this collection, learning, being discipled in the best kind of music, classic rock. Can I get an amen? And, like, and, and, he, and if you understand this, you know. And then you fast forward a number of years, and it's 2018. It's my last Christmas with my dad. And I'm in Grand Rapids, and my dad's really, really frail. He's really sick. He's on oxygen. Any kind of movement just takes everything out of him. And he looks at me and goes, Steve, let's go down to the basement. And I'm like, no, I, I don't think so, man. Let's just stay here. Let's just, just stay here. Stay comfortable. He goes, no, no, we got to go down to the basement. And I'm like, okay. And so he gets up, and he begins to walk, and it's just gingerly walking downstairs. And then, like, one hand, like, I'm just reaching out, hoping he doesn't fall. I'm scared of my mind. And we start walking down these stairs, and we get down to the stairs. I'm like, exhale, like, we made it. And then all of a sudden, we turn a corner. And there's the milk cartons and stacks and stacks of records. And there's that bass guitar. And my dad looks at me out of breath. And he goes, you know, I know that you used to go into my office and listen to my records. And I'm like, what? I thought this was like protected like Fort Knox. What do you mean? He goes, yeah, I know. I'm like, how do you know? He's like, they're always out of order. I'm like, wait, wait, what? Like, I put Led Zeppelin back where Led Zeppelin record was. And he goes, no, 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 you don't understand. I had it in order by when the album came out. And I was like, ugh. He was so OCD. If you know people with OCD, he was so OCD, he couldn't even call it OCD because it was out of order. He called it CDO. <laughs> and and here, here's the thing. He, he looks at these, these records, he looks at this guitar, and then he just says, I want you to have these. I'm like, what? Because I, I don't know how much time I have left. But I want you to hear these records. And every time you hear these records, I want you to know how much I love you and how proud I am of you. And I want you to have this guitar. And I want you to know how much I love you and how proud I am of you. And that, that guitar is like in my office hanging on the wall. And I've started to realize something. Because it wasn't just about the gift. I mean, you've all received great gifts from a spouse, from a parent, from a friend, from a child. You've all received great gifts. And if you really, really think about the gift that you've received, doesn't every great gift reveal something about the giver? Every great gift reveals something about the giver. I mean, when someone hands you an Amazon gift card for Christmas, what does that reveal about the giver? They're like, I don't know what to get you. I forgot about you, but Walgreens had some Amazon gift cards, and I bought a card, and I... But you've had a moment where someone like my dad put thought and energy and kindness and love into it, and all of a sudden you realize that revealed something about my dad. 
It wasn't about records. It wasn't about a bass guitar. It was about the characteristics of my father. Friends, let me tell you about Christmas. You're the reason for the season. Let me tell you about Christmas. Jesus is the gift, but Jesus is. Gift reveals something about the giver. And who is the giver? John 3.16 tells us, For God, the great giver, so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, the true gift, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting and eternal life. Do you understand something? The characteristic of God, who is love, the characteristic of God, who is grace, truth, mercy, the characteristic of God that would be so willing to give his son up so that you would live a life of purpose and meaning, that you wouldn't just know attributes of a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace, but she would have access to it. I mean, think about this in comparison to, to King Herod. For King Herod, can you go back one? For King Herod so loved himself that he gave the world such great architecture that whoever worshiped and believed in him would not perish. I mean, like, Whoever didn't believe in him, yeah, King Herod was like, you're done. But this God, this amazing giver, gave us the gift of his son so that our lives would be transformed, our lives would be saved, our lives would be rescued. I love Christmas morning, especially having kids. I love the anticipation. I love the expectation. I love the sheer joy when you're getting woken up at 530 I love going to the tree. I love seeing kids just open presents. I love them seeing it and like, oh my goodness. And they go to the next one, bows and, and, and Christmas wrapping papers everywhere. But parents, you all are sneaky. Especially you moms. I'll tell you what. And moms, you, I feel like, feel like you don't get honored enough. But moms always have this like act. My theory. Where they've got these amazing gifts that they have. But they're holding and hiding the one true gift that the kid wants. So the kids go through all their presents and they're like, ah. Oh. But they don't do that. They do it internally because they don't want mom or dad to feel bad. But the mom then goes, how was Christmas this year? And she knows what she's doing. And, and the kid goes, oh, I was really good. I'm really grateful. I want to cry inside because I didn't get what I wanted. But really grateful. And then the mom's like, you know what? I need some coffee because I've, I've just been up super early, she walks into the kitchen and the kid's like playing with the second most favorite toy and the mom then walks down to the basement and she's like, oh, the craziest thing happened. I forgot one gift, which is a huge mountain bike and she carries it up and she's like, huh, this is crazy and then the kid's eyes light up. Oh, <gasps> A PS5, an Oculus, a mountain bike. Oh, my goodness. Now, can you imagine if this child sees that gift and runs up to it and goes, I don't want it. I've never seen a child deny a gift. I've never seen a person deny a gift that revealed something so beautifully profound from a place of love and grace and peace of the giver. But so often in our, in, our, in our world, we've missed out on the true meaning of Christmas, and so we watch people just deny the gift of grace that's available in the gift of Jesus. And I, I think for many of us, we have to wrestle with that. Maybe our lives are being interrupted in the season because truth be told, our lives look a little bit more like Herod than they do God. I'm, I'm sure, I'm not saying you're monsters. I'm not saying you've killed anybody. I'm not saying, but I think in the sense of trying to achieve, earn our identity, prove, showcase to the world that we're greater than anybody else, competing with our neighbor, comparing to our neighbor, feeling threatened and driven by insecurity and shame rather than grace, love, and mercy. That's the Herod plan. That's the Herod plan. And Christmas is an invitation to receive the great giver's gift of grace, mercy, love, justice, truth, and peace through the life of a man by the name of Jesus. You're the reason for the season. So you have to ask yourself, is it Herod or God? Herod's plan or God's plan? And Herod was driven by abuse of power, and God was driven by access to power. 
God's gift was giving you access to power. Herod's was like, I'm just going to abuse power. You're going to get on my plan. You're going to be pushed aside. And last night, I was, I was seated right over there, and Emma started to sing. She started to sing, you know, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And then she started to sing those lines from Isaiah 9. I didn't even know she was going to do it. And so as she was singing, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, I just started to think, like, this is, this is exactly what the message was. So after, after the song and the worship, first worship set was done, I just ran up to him. I'm like, hey, I don't know if I can do this, but can we do a total audible? And can you sing that song over the congregation? And they're just so humble and so good. And they were like, yeah, totally. I just started thinking about this. I think for some of us in this, in this place today, this might be a good interruption for us. A good interruption for us to kind of look at our life and say, man, maybe I'm just trying to earn my worth, trying to achieve, trying to know facts about Jesus, but I don't actually have access to his power, access to finding my identity in him, access to that peace. I, I just don't have it. And maybe you just need to like have this song just sung over you. And maybe, maybe in your own heart, your own way, you just gotta be really, really honest and say, I need to get off Herod's plan trying to prove my greatness. It's about God's greatness. Trying to prove my worth. No, it's about God's worth. Trying to prove that I matter. No, 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 no. Here's the thing. God is the great giver. He gave us this amazing gift to rescue and save and redeem, restore, renew us. So I want you to hear this. Just allow your heart just to maybe see, is there, is there any Herod in us? Any Herod in you? Maybe this is a good interruption. And after that, I'm going to come up and then just lead us in a creative response. And then the song will be sung over us again. And then I'll pray, and then we'll respond in a song. Um, but just hear these words. And just ask yourself honestly, is any of Herod's plan in me? And maybe you just need to surrender that for a good interruption so that you can experience the fullness of what Christmas is all about. plan just driving much of my life I knew facts about Jesus but I didn't know I had access to it and I think for some of you 2020 maybe you've just been doing it in your own strength maybe today the gift of Christmas the gift of Christ is recognizing that you have access to this wonderful counselor who wants to guide you who wants to guard you who wants to help you live a life for Jesus. And, and I love coming to Foundations because I feel like you're people who want to experience more of God. And I always say, like, we sometimes we do creative things because if we can't do it here, it's going to be harder for us to do it outside these walls. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is have one of four responses. For some of you, maybe at Windsor or here in Loveland or online, maybe for some of you in this season, you just need that counsel. And if that's you in a moment, as Emma sings it over us, I'm just gonna invite you to open up your hands and just say, I need this. I need counsel. Maybe it's in this one area of my life. I just need heaven's wisdom. I need that wonderful counselor more than ever. Or maybe for some of you, you need access to the mighty God, to El Gabor. Maybe it's not necessarily the, the counsel. You, you got that, but, but you've just lost the reality that you know that you can reach out and you can grab hold of that mighty power, that resurrection power that is within you, that God has given you access to. And maybe for some of you, 
In this season, you just feel like that woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, and you're like, I just don't know where else to go. God, help me. And maybe for some of you, it's wonderful counsel. That's what you need, open hands. But maybe for some of you in this room, in Windsor online, you just need to reach out as a sense and a sign of faith that I am reaching out because I need God's El Gabor. I need that mighty power. Or maybe for some of you, you get triggered when you see the phrase everlasting father. And you're like, I don't have a good father. Maybe, maybe for some of you, it's just hard because maybe your dad was gone too soon. I feel that. See, my dad died of leukemia. It's too soon. It's too soon. And what I think about this everlasting father is that this gift that God gave us in his son was that I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. It's like before Jesus does anything, any miracle, any, anything that would have the crowd say, this guy's different, God said, this is my son whom I love, whom I'm well pleased. And from that place, Jesus lived with integrity. And maybe for some of you, you have not received the gift of finding your identity in Christ. You found it in other places. And maybe for you and some others, it's wonderful counsel you need. Maybe for some of you, it's El Gabor, mighty God. But isn't it fascinating that when we talk about becoming a follower of Jesus, we talk about being born again. <laughs> the idea is that you are born into a new family. You're born into an ever everlasting father's family. You're given a new identity. You're seen in a new way. And it begins this process of becoming a new kind of person. And I just wonder, maybe today, if you've lost sight of your identity, maybe you've never received the gift of Jesus, I'm gonna ask you to do something bold. Wonderful counsels, just open up your hands. Mighty God's like literally reaching. But maybe if you wanna be part of this family as Emma's just singing, I'm just gonna invite you to stand up. Whether in Windsor, you can use an emoji if you want online, or whether in this room, maybe that's what you need. Or maybe you just need peace. Too much stress, too much worry, too much anxiety, too much shame, it's just driving you. And maybe you just need access to shalom. And there's times for me where I just need to be reminded. Almost need to like breathe in God's love, God's mercy, God's peace, and breathe out my problems because I have to deal with the rivalry. My problems versus his power, my problems versus his promise, my problems versus his perspective, my problems versus his peace. And as Emma sings this, maybe you just don't need to put your hands out to receive counsel or reach out for El Gabor, mighty God, or stand to enter in the family. Maybe you just need to breathe breathe in his peace breathe out the worry breathe in his peace breathe out the shame so we're just sing the song twice over you and just gonna invite you wherever you are online winds are here to respond open hands reaching out standing up or just simply breathe receive this time now his name shall be Too often in the church, we know facts about you, but we don't have access to you. 
or we don't live like we have access to you. There's too much worry. There's too much shame. There's just too much pain right now. But I'm grateful for the gift. And I'm grateful for what that gift reveals about you, the ultimate giver. I pray even in the days leading up to Christmas, you would fill our minds with people who need to be reminded of the true gift, the true meaning of Christmas. I pray that their lives would be interrupted this Christmas season because we would have the courage to make an invitation, whether to the Christmas services, whether to share the Christmas services online, whether just to reach out and let them know that they are the reason for the season. This gift named Jesus, and this incredible giver of love named God. God, I pray that in these coming days leading up to the birth of your son, that you would make a way so that people can experience who you are and how you are so for all your people. Let us sing together.